arms extended as he raises one into right center field. At the wall, it is caught. Oh, what a catch by Torrey Hunter. Is that any good? That'll wake you up. My goodness. Way over the wall to take a home run away from Barry Bonds. And fans in Minnesota will tell you that's routine for this guy. And Bonds <laughs> says thanks a lot. It's called the Midsummer Classic for a reason because we have these classic moments. It is the showcase of summer for Major League Baseball. But calling an all-star game is not as easy as it thinks. Welcome to Crafting the Call. I'm Josh Sushan from the Albuquerque Isotopes. And I'm Jesse Goldberg Strassler from the Lansing Lugnuts. In fact, Josh, I would argue calling an all-star game is very difficult. And so that's why I'm eager to talk through with you the best ways to call an all-star game, to prepare and then to execute. Well, I'm excited too, because just like in our no hitter episode, it's very easy for me to tell you all of my experiences covering all-star games. Zero, nothing. <laughs> Once again, a big fat donut. And so, but I, what I can bring you is what it's like as a reporter to cover a game, what it's like as a fan to be sitting in the stands for a game, and what it's like as a viewer to be watching a game on television. You can provide a lot of those as well, in addition to what it's like to be on the microphone for a game. So for me, my background, my very first job in baseball, I was an intern, the media intern for the Brockton Rocks in 2005, where we hosted the Can-Am League versus Central League Baseball All-Star Game, good old CLB. Okay, my very next year, 2006, I go down to the Southern League with Montgomery, where we host the 2006 Southern League All-Star Game. So then I join the Lansing Lugnuts, where we host the Midwest League All-Star Game. That was 2018. So I've got a little bit of All-Star experience. In 2005, I was in the studio, lightning hit a transformer, knocked everything out. So I had to host a show for hours until they had everyone ready to go and to play baseball. So I'm just doing my, uh, my call-in show. And then for the others, for 2006, I'm doing play-by-play -play for a home run derby. It's it's such an experience. There's so much that you have to prepare for. You don't know which players are going to come in. You don't know who are going to be the late substitutions and the late scratches. There's a lot that goes into it before the All-Star game ever, uh, ever even rolls around. There was one other time that I almost called an All-Star game. It's 2007, California League. Stockton was the host. I was broadcasting for Modesto. For people who don't know, it's about 30-minute distance. And the idea was that the Stockton announcer, my good friend, Zach Bay Rudy, and I would both broadcast the game. However, at the last moment, someone at one of the radio stations said that I can't be on their radio station because they're different radio station partners and they're in the same market. So as it turned out, Zach had to do the game by himself, but I was trying my best to be his spotter and to be the one who tells him about all of these changes out there with the binoculars, passing him notes constantly. And I remember thinking, kind of relieved that I'm not on the air because it is exhausting trying to keep up with everything. Yeah, it's you're the MVP. It's a little bit like spring training in terms of guys are coming in, guys are going out, and that's why it helps. And this is a little bit of a different subject entirely. It helps to have the players wear their own team's uniform instead of the all-star game uniform. And as someone who's with the team that hosted, I remember my owner saying, I want everyone to have special all-star game uniforms for this game. But as we're going to see, and as we just saw with Torrey Hunter and Barry Bonds, the tradition of having that player wear his own team's uniform to the game makes it a lot easier for a spotter, in addition to other positives as you look back over the years. Okay, so before we get into the clips, I want to give just sort of like my big picture view of, of all-star games. Th this is my perspective as a journalist, as a fan, as, as an observer, is that to me, it's about who is the biggest star in baseball at the time? That first clip, Barry Bonds was the biggest star in baseball at the time. Second thing would be who is attending their final all-star game? One year was Mariano Rivera. Another year, it was Cal Ripken Jr. And then my third thing is who is the young star that we are watching for the first time where this is where the nation, the entire nation, gets to see this player? That's going to be Paul Skeens of the Pirates this year, in my opinion. So I feel like the journalist in me thinks within the context of this all-star game, what are the biggest moments within the moments? 
And to me, those are the three moments. But then, Jesse, there's also these light, fun moments, like Torrey Hunter robbing a home run and Barry Bonds tackling him, or just like other fun moments that arise throughout an all-star game where you need to be ready for them. Could you give me an example of one of these fun moments? I have a very good example of a fun moment. Johnny Crook fanning himself off. Johnson has had pitches clocked at as much as 102 miles per hour in Major League play. Now, that, this ball uh, obviously just getting away from him, but watch the reaction of John Crook. Would you say he is... Hart is palpitating a bit. When the second half resumes on Thursday. <laughs> Look at the next step. I don't blame John one bit on his right leg. <laughs> he failed out again at the breaking point. He wants no part of Randy Johnson. None. Is no. this kind of response? No, I don't think so. <laughs> you knew that was gone. John had no chance. <laughs> and Johnson works a one, two, three inning. When Randy Johnson, one of the most fierce competitors ever, is smiling, you know it's a really good television moment, Jesse. It's the color commentator's game. And we heard Tim McCarver on the very first call with Torrey Hunter, what Joe Buck said that Barry Bonds didn't get his arms extended, extended enough. But it's Tim McCarver who brought the fun of it, the wake up. And it's Tim McCarver blending the analysis. He's got a 102 mile an hour fastball with the feel for the moment. And this is... This is why people really enjoyed Tim McCarver when he was in his prime, was he could blend the smarts with the feel for, hey, let's smile and enjoy this right here. And this is absolutely something that you should sit back and you should watch and you should look at the reactions of everybody. My favorite camera shots, in addition to watching John Cruck playing all this up because Randy Johnson does not break facial expression the entire time. <laughs> show me the bench, show me Frank Thomas, show me Sparky. Okay, so based on what you just said, you immediately just made me think about play-by-play -play announcer's job for an all-star game. Minimalism. Just give us quick little bullet points and then stay out of the way. Let the director tell the story. Let the analyst shine through. Let the crowd shots that this isn't at all about the play-by-play -play announcer. We just heard Sean McDonough on that last call. And just being as small and brief as you can to let the other shine. I mean, what's the classic moment of the very first highlight that we saw? It's Barry Bonds picking up Tory Hunter. So it's all of these interactions of these greatest stars of their day as they meet on the same playing field and we get to see their true quality and we also get to see how they interact with each other. So yes, it is the shots and then it's how you react to them. Okay, well, sometimes the reaction is based on just an amazing play that happens in the game. And I'm wearing my billy ball t-shirt for this episode because 1987 the all-star game was played in oakland and billy martin is no longer the manager by 1987 it's tony la Russa, but still i think of billy martin as the kid from berkeley in oakland who managed the oakland a's in the early 80s and i was a kid who attended the 1987 all-star game in person it's one of my biggest most happiest moments of my baseball career as a fan even though the game was extremely boring. But there was one play late in the game that was a fabulous play. And so let's listen in as Vin Scully and Joe Garagiola describe a, a remarkable play near the end of the 1987 All-Star Game. Fastball hit wide at first. Keith goes down to shortstop, the throw to Bedrosian, no good. Winfield to the plate, the throw to the plate. He is out at the plate to Virgil. Three, six, one, two, and quite a play by Bedrosian. Yes, it was. He was late in covering first base, and it looked like the throw was going to get by him. They still tried for the double play, a very daring play, maybe not a smart play, but Bedrosian, the diving catch. Now watch. He's very late in covering. Brooks's throw is into the outfit. Look at Bedrosian, a diving catch to save it. And now he looks around and he sees Winfield coming and Virgil becomes a dead end. He stops and he's just going to go head and head. Look at that. What a catch by Bedrosi. And otherwise, that's a wild throw and the winning run walks in. And at the end of nine, we are where we started. No score. 
okay, when Vin Scully says, at the end of nine, we are where we started. That's one of my favorite lines that Vin says. I rarely get a chance to use that line in the Pacific Coast League, Jesse, but I love being able to say maybe after three innings, we are where we started. Oh, stay scoreless as long as possible for you. Uh, there is so much happening on this play. The great classic collision in the All-Star game is Pete Rose, right? But here's Dave Winfield, big man, and there's Ozzy Virgil ready to take it. What chaos, and what a great job by Vin, making sure that he's got all the names right as all of this is ensuing. Yes, seriously, there is so much that is happening on that play. I think that Gary Giola was outstanding in his analysis there. Um, yeah, the play by Steve Bedrosian. So I, when, I was, when I was watching that game, I was a little bit to the left of the American League dugout, the home dugout. And so I remember having like a really good angle of that entire play. I've seen the throw and seeing here comes Winfield and rising up to see if this was how the game was going to end. And I think that all of us in the Bay Area, really around baseball, but especially in the Bay Area, Ray Fossey became a beloved Oakland A's commentator on TV for a really long time. And I think those of us who got to know Ray always kind of, um, just kind of cringed when we know, okay, here comes the all-star game and Ray's going to have to see this highlight over and over again. And, and I almost wonder again, that, that happened around 1971 and this is 1987. So maybe Dave Winfield as he's rounding third is thinking about, am I going to do this? And then you can see, he starts to kind of like try to run over Ozzy Virgil. And then he realizes maybe this isn't such a good idea, but it's still baseball. And this is what, in the 1990s, there suddenly was this uproar of how do we get the all-star game back to being competitive? How do we get them back to playing baseball? Because so many people had in their memories that in the all-star game, you still play real baseball. The other thing that strikes me, and this isn't really about play-by-play, -play, it's just the number of stars who were still in the game in the ninth inning, right? He had Dave Winfield, future Hall of Famer. He had Keith Hernandez. Yeah, he had Hubie Brooks and Ozzy Virgil. Steve Bedrosian was in the game for a reason because he was, I believe that he won the Cy Young that year, right? Um, but just a lot of different things happening in that call. And again, it makes me smile and remember the time that I attended that game. About that, about, remember, you said the things that you really love about the All-Star game and the main ideas. Uh, let me add to it the snapshot, the whole notion of that you put on an All-Star game and you and I can say, oh my gosh, here's a Hall of Famer at first base. Here's a Hall of Famer in center field. We're going to see two Hall of Famers coming up this inning against a Hall of Fame pitcher. This whole feeling of we've got best versus best, and this is going to be a blast. And you can go into any year, and the final score of the game doesn't matter because you can find this inning or that inning, and you and I are going to want to stop and watch this one-on-one -on -one battle. Let me ask you a question, Jesse. In the number of All-Star games that you worked, how often, if at all, did you have like a special guest, someone who joins the broadcast because of their involvement in the game or their history in that city or something like that? In general, I would have the league president on. I'd have the person in charge of the league and maybe I would have other people. But the thing about all-star games that I found is pitchers throw first pitch fastballs and second pitch fastballs. A batter's swing at first and second pitch fastballs. So you have to get out of the way. There's no real, there is going to be time to tell the story here. The pitchers are going to throw strikes. The batters are going to be challenged to swing. Nobody is really grinding out in that bat in the All-Star game. And so if there is a guest, there just has to be this understanding of, we might need to stay out of the way a little bit, or there's a new player in, let me name the names. Because you really need to identify, here's this batter, here's this pitcher. That's what everybody is looking forward to. And if you're a fan watching at home, you want to see when's my guy going to get involved. So that's great insight. But also league presidents don't necessarily understand all of these things, right? Like they're, no. they're excited. They want to talk. They have some bullet points. They're usually pretty long winded. So sometimes so, you have a league president who is joining your broadcast. And then other times you have the president of the United States of America joining your broadcast with the broadcasting background. Yes. <laughs> but uh, that bow down there, that's a pretty interesting hobby he has for his vacation. When baseball ends, he winds up uh, playing uh, playing football. I, I just, I don't know if there's ever been anyone do that. Hey. He's remarkable, and look at that one. Bo Jackson says hello. Dan 
and Rick Russell is greeted on the first pitch to Bo Jackson. He almost hit it out of state. Now, you know, that's going to set it up pretty interesting for him to the end of this season when he goes back to the Los Angeles Raiders. Watch this again, sir. Does it feel a great deal different sitting here doing a television game as opposed to the days of recreating? It is different. This is, I can't get quite used to this. Hey, that looks like it's going there, too. Eric Davis to the track. There it is. Gone. electrifying moment here in Anaheim with the National League leading two to nothing consecutive home run by Bo Jackson and Wade Boggs and the last time we had consecutive home runs in an all-star game was 1975. But you know both of those home runs you didn't have to wait for them even the outfielders knew they were going out of the park. They the sure did. Okay. Quick clarification. I'm just remembering 1989, Ronald Reagan was no longer president. George H.W. Bush had taken over. So the first thing that comes to my mind, Jesse, is that Vin doesn't panic, right? Ronald Reagan is in the middle of saying something. Bo Jackson has hit this ball. The crowd is starting to get excited. It is really easy to panic in this moment. I'm missing out on this home run. But Vin stays calm in the moment and still finds the right words when he says, and Bo Jackson says, hello. It's a TV call. The pictures are showing you what you need to see. So here we've got Ronald Reagan making an understated joke, which Vin launches into. The first thing he says is he's remarkable, right? With exalting praise, with this energy as he's launching into as the shot gets launched. And what a perfect example. First pitch from Russell, it's hittable. Bo hits it, Vin's ready as Ronald Reagan is discussing. And it's it's such a classic example of what the All-Star Game is about. The next batter, Wade Boggs, they do get the chance to chat a little bit more because the count goes full. But you're right, it's a TV call. So Vin waits and takes and goes and punches. And there's a great punch for that homer. There was another thing that Vin did that I think was subtle, that I think was, was really neat, is he said, watch this again, sir. And I'm picturing that they're in the booth and maybe Vin is like angling himself to Ronald Reagan. And maybe he even like sticks out a hand, touches his wrist or something, points to the monitor and says, watch this again, sir. And even the way that Vin understands the proper respect for a former president to say, watch this again, sir. And how he leads Ronald Reagan into giving the analysis of that home run. Well, exactly. And guiding his eye discipline. Where should he be looking right now? Let's look at the monitor. Let's watch the instant replay and let's discuss that together. Uh, it's There's a reason that Vin is the consummate professional. And that was a highly professional, respectful touch. Another thing that just struck me, Jesse, is how much life is about timing. And so during that time period, during the 80s, the way that it worked is NBC and ABC they split the broadcast rights. And so every year, each one of them would have, one would have the American League Championship Series, the other would have the National League Championship Series. And then one would have the All-Star Game and the other would have the World Series. And then the next year they would flip-flop. And so you think about the timing of these flip-flops. Scully was on the call in 86 for the Mets and Red Sox and we broke down his calls. Scully was on the call in 88. The Dodgers announcer is on the call as Kirk Gibson hits this home run. Oral Hershiser has this incredible postseason. And so once again, Vin is on the call for that. Now it's 1989. It's the odd numbered year, which means that ABC gets the World Series and NBC has the All-Star Game. And it's in Southern California where Vin Scully is from. There's a pretty good chance that Vin Scully's probably met Ronald Reagan multiple times over the years. And so once again, the timing just works out into this. But even then you go, okay, the 1989 World Series, that's the earthquake. Al Michaels, who lived in the Bay Area, who was a Giants broadcaster for a number of years, Al really knew the Bay Area. He was able to lead ABC News' coverage as they were showing images from the blimp. And Al Michaels was able to identify all of these places because he had lived in the Bay Area. And so the timing of how all of these things just really strikes me is just, 
just incredibly fortuitous timing, Jesse. Baseball to the West Coast. I love that Crafting the Call has our West Coast bias because that's where everything was happening. That's where Vin is. That's where Bill is. That's where um, the A's dynasty is getting built and so much is happening. Kurt Gibson off Eck. Vin Scully. Of course he's met Ronald Reagan because Reagan comes out as the governor of California to the presidency. So yeah, center of the universe where you are growing up and your baseball fandom is getting formed. All right. Well, speaking of the ace, let's go with another ace clip. And this one's going to go way back into the archives, something that happened before Jesse or I was born, but something that I guarantee you we will see as part of every single all-star game coverage highlights until the end of time. Reggie Jackson, batting 272 for Oakland, 17 homers. He's bounced back this year, 41 runs batted in. A fine all-around player. Good defensive outfielder, base runner, and thrower. And, of course, real power, especially for this ballpark, at the strike to him. Aparicio on first, nobody out. This Doc is Ellis was a no-hitter at San Diego in June of 1970. He walked eight in that game, hit a batter. And still pitched a no-hit, no-run game. There's a long drive. That one is going way up. It is off the roof. That hit the transformer up there. A tremendous smash. Only eight players have hit the ball over the roof here in Detroit. And Jackson nearly did it then out of the ballpark. It's been done 13 times, Kurt. Norm Cash has done it the most four times. Mantle has done it three. Williams has done it. But that one was really a smash, more toward right center field. Longest ball ever to be hit out in that area was estimated at 560 feet by Norm Cash. What a smash. Tony, remember the home run we saw him hit in Minnesota year before last. It measured 500 and some feet off the top of the scoreboard there in the Twin Stadium. Let me start with this, Jesse. When someone says Kurt Gowdy is a broadcaster, what types of words come to mind for you? Professional. I think and, of understated. And yeah. this is one where Kurt Gowdy, this might be one of the most high-pitched, excited calls, which really illustrates just how far Reggie Jackson hit this ball. When someone hits a home run, when someone hits a fly ball, does your eye go to the ball and trace its path? Yes, initially. Okay. Off the bat, I watch the ball, I start to make a judgment, and then my eye immediately goes to the outfielder to see if what I'm seeing matches what the outfielder is seeing, and then I kind of go back and forth between the ball and the outfielder. That's something that I struggle with, quite frankly. I, I Sometimes the ball will launch off the bat, and I'll watch it, and then I'll pick up the outfielder or pick up the umpire or whomever, and I sometimes have struggles getting back to it. Kurt Gowdy sees this ball the entire time which allows him to immediately say, roof, transformer. And then you've got, is that Tony Kubek on color? Mm -hmm. Tony is brilliant. This is a great call. Kurt is right on it and right where the ball is hitting with the proper excitement level and the detail and description. Because I don't know if we, the audience, can see, actually see that via the camera. I think that might escape us. We need some slow motion instant replays and some angles and perspectives that we aren't getting. So we need Kurt to say, this is where the ball went off of. And now we need Tony to supply in all the background. Who's done this before? How far is it? What kind of context historically does that put this in? So I think that all of what Kurt and Tony add makes the home run even more majestic. It's really interesting. And as you say that, what comes to mind for me is that the homework that you do to prepare for an all-star game maybe the history of the ballpark is just as important as the players, right? Knowing how many players have hit it on the roof. What is the longest home run? Just what is the history of this ballpark? Being able to, even like the way that umpires walk around the field before game one of the series, maybe as a broadcaster walking around and making sure that you know all these nooks and crannies where the ball might take a weird bounce, you know, trend, you know even just knowing that it's a transformer that's up on the top of the roof knowing the history of the ballpark and everything that might happen becomes a really important part of the research. 
Yes, and let me add, and this is where preparing for an All-Star game is exhausting. Remember, we just saw Bowen Boggs at homers, and Vin Scully can immediately tell us when was the last time that back-to-back homers were hidden in an All-Star game. So you also have to have all of your All-Star game records, the last time this happened, the last time that that happened. You've got to have your prep work on each one of these players, every new pitcher who comes in, every new position player who comes in. So there are so many different things that you have to have at your disposal. All the while, usually, All-Star game at-bats are flying by. I'm going to be gentle toward you and other broadcasters to the minor league level because with all due respect to Vin Scully and to Kurt Gowdy and to everybody else, it's called, yes, there is a staff that works on these things. And normally, not only is there a staff that prepares these things, there's somebody sitting right next to you that is putting pieces of paper right in front of you to make sure that you remember these things so that you don't have to memorize it or fumble through your notes trying to see where you wrote it down. Well, the excitement, too, from that staff member, the excitement from the spotter or from the statistician, they get on top of the world, and rightfully so, because suddenly here is a moment that they have the exact right notation to be used on the broadcast right there. It feels great. There's one other thing from that clip that stood out to me that I wrote down. Before the home run, Kurt Gowdy is explaining who Reggie Jackson is. Okay, This is 1971. Reggie's only been in the league for a couple of years. He is not an MVP yet. He is not Mr. October. The A's have not been to any World Series yet. And he uses the phrase, he's bounced back from last year. So immediately we understand, okay, probably in 1969, that indeed was the year that he had an enormous number of home runs before the All-Star break, tailed off in the second half, had a down year in 1970. Now here he is back in 1971. And he mentioned what an all-around player he was. He runs well. He has a good throwing arm. So these are quick little bullet points that Gowdy is giving us as the audience so that we understand a little bit more about who Reggie Jackson is. And he also includes, before the home run, he has tremendous power. Sets the stage for that swing. I want to go back, though, because it's an introduction. And at the very start, you mentioned this year's All-Star Game is going to be about introducing Paul Skeens. That is the broadcaster's job, is to introduce each of these players to an audience who has not met him before. I remember as a kid, the very first All-Star Games that featured new teams, expansion teams, new uniforms. So I'd get to see the new uniforms, rookie sensations, or guys who are just establishing themselves. When Andres Galarraga came out of nowhere for the Colorado Rockies, here's Galarraga and here's what he's doing. When Carlos Perez took them out for the Montreal Expos, and I remember the broadcaster saying, wait till you see his histrionics. There is so much about an All-Star Game and the players and who they are, that it's the broadcaster's job to say to fans and watchers who've never seen them before or who do not understand what makes them special, all right, here's Luis Arias, and here's why he's good. Here is Marcel Osuna, or here is who you name, here comes Mason Miller of the Oakland Athletics, and this is why you're going to need to sit up in your chair and watch him. That phrase you just used, Wait until you see. What a fabulous way to get someone excited. That's the ultimate tease. I'm not going to tell you what you're going to see. Wait until you see his histrionics. That is that is fabulous. Ooh, I, I got to remember to say that more often. <laughs> it's beautiful because you as the broadcaster are sharing the experience with the fans. And so you really do get to sit back and say, we are going to enjoy this together. Now let's get, let's see what happens. When it comes to the start of an all-star game, the star amongst stars, who is going to be the starting pitcher? This becomes such a huge decision for the manager and it becomes such a controversial decision for the manager. Now, sometimes it's out of your power because the person who had the best half, the best storyline, maybe he started on Sunday. You're not going to start him on one day rest. But then there's other times that you have to factor in. Who's the biggest star in baseball? Where is this game being played? And sometimes all of those things come together as they did in 1999. What a perfect way to wind down this millennium with an all-star game here at Fenway Park. Built in 1912. First pitch, a blazing fastball that misses up and away from hometown starter Pedro Martinez, a 15-game winner, the only 15-game winner in the major leagues to this point. One ball, no strikes on Barry Larkin. 
Larkin involved in his 10th All-Star game, and he's going to have to crank it up another notch to catch up with that fastball from Martinez. One ball, one strike. And then when hitters decide to crank it up, Martinez throws the changeup like that. Missing low and away, two balls and a strike. And it's just not an average changeup. It's probably the best changeup of any pitcher in the major leagues today. On two and one, Larkin took it over the outside corner. Two balls, two strikes from mid-80s to mid-90s on that fastball. And you look at the 15-game winner with that league-leading ERA of 2.10. Three complete games for Pedro Martinez. Larkin way late, still two and two. We see the scouting report on Pedro Martinez. Great movement on the fastball. We've seen that already. Works both sides of the plate. We've seen the great change up with the arm action. He also has a curveball. I mean, this is not fair. A guy with three top shelf pitches at his disposal. Still two and two. Lead off hitter Barry Larkin. That'll get out of play to keep it two balls, two strikes as Pedro cranks it up to 97 miles per hour. Larry Walker will follow and then Sammy Sosa. As this crowd settles in on what has already been an emotional night here at Fenway Park. Again, the 2-2 to Larkin leading off. And spoiling a nasty pitch to stay up there. Well, National League pitchers are familiar with this particular action from Barry Larkin, falling behind in the count, fouling off a lot of tough pitches, staying alive, hoping that pitcher makes a mistake. Here's Bochy, a quick look at the manager for the National League, looking at a 35-year-old shortstop in Barry Larkin that's still one of the game's best. Got him with a changeup and a good start for Pedro Martinez in the American League. Once again. Okay, I think also a good start for the Fox broadcast here. So this is Joe Buck, who sounds much different nowadays than he did in 1999, and also Tim McCarver, and also Bob Brenly. And a couple of things that stand out, just a few phrases. The hometown starter, Pedro Martinez. I like that. There's a point where Tim McCarver is describing the changeup, and just as he finishes describing the changeup, Pedro throws one, and he says, like that. Really good. And then also the other thing that immediately stands out to me, Jesse, is that Bob Brindley is not normally part of the broadcast crew. It's Joe Buck and it's Tim McCarver. But I think that you really see just the generosity for McCarver in making sure that, okay, let's get Brindley into this. Let's have him describe what Pedro throws. Let's let Brindley get into this and feel like he's part of this broadcast right away. I think it's a difficult start for Joe Buck in terms of, hey, take it back. Let's go. And by the way, here's the first pitch to Barry Larkin, because he's got in his mind the setting of the stage. It's the end of the millennium. It's Fenway Park, opened up in 1912. We've got things to discuss. Here's the Red Sox starter. Oh, by the way, here's baseball. Has that happened to you before, where you were trying to get all sorts of things out? Oh, by the way, here comes the pitch. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, that happens on a regular basis. And remember, this is 1999, and I believe Joe Buck took over as the lead voice for Fox in 96. So this is his fourth year. It's no longer his first All-Star game, but he's not the Joe Buck of 20 years experience in handling all of these things as well. So I think that's an important distinction, too. But yes, very much, Jesse. I feel like one of my main focuses in the first inning, I want to get into a rhythm with the starting pitcher. I want to know how long does he take after he gets the sign, after he nods, even when he comes stretch, how long does he pause before he goes? I want to just get a feel for how many words, approximately how much time I have to say so that I'm not stumbling on my words, trying to finish a story as here comes the pitch. Let me criticize the Fox broadcast team in terms of this. What we heard from broadcast teams earlier in the show is the broadcasters chat with each other. And there's not a lot of talking with one another, right? It's Joe Buck talks, it's Tim McCarver talks, it's Bob Brenly talks, and here's the next pitch. And so, it, of course, it's the very start of the game. We need to get out our graphics. We need to get out, here's the scattering report on Pedro Martinez, and we've just gotten underway. And who is he? And oh, by the way, here's the National League manager. There's so many different things that you're checking boxes as you're just trying to ease in, and that, is one of the great challenges of the All-Star Game. 
there is so much that you just have to say, let's check this off. Let's check this off. All right, here's the pitch. Thankfully, Barry Larkin gave them a good long at bat for them to ease in and get into the next batter. I'm going to pause. I'm going to start this. In the National League starting lineup, sponsored by Budweiser. Here tonight, Barry Larkin. All right, because I'm tired of looking at that graphic that says National League. Uh, <laughs> so, oh, by the I, way, I, what, they haven't even given the starting lineup yet. So it's actually, uh, I'm glad you brought this up, because actually one of my biggest criticisms of the three-person broadcast booth is it very much becomes your turn to talk, your turn to talk, your turn to talk. It's not as much of a natural two-person back-and-forth conversation. It's very much, we have to, you know, it's almost like, we're going to throw to the tight end. We're going to throw to the wide receiver. We're going to throw to the running back out of the backfield, right? It very much becomes your turn, your turn, your turn, especially in the first inning when you're trying to get everybody involved with this. And, yeah, there's so much information that you want to get out. Here comes this graphic. This is when Fox was really into, like, we have these robots that are going to do these things and these other loud noises that are going to happen as well as we're giving you the starting lineups. Hey, a new millennium is coming embrace the robots the Mets booth has figured this out with a three guy team and the chemistry works because everyone's all chatting together but it is hard and it does strike me as we look at that lineup graphic right now just how many different things they're saying now hit this now hit this all the while we're one batter in I can't remember where I heard it but apparently before the first game for the Mets broadcast with Keith Hernandez and Ron Darling, they were trying to figure out, well, how's this going to work with a three-person booth? And I forget which one said it, but let, let's pretend like it was Ron Darling. And Ron Darling said, if there's something involving offense, you talk. If there's something involving pitching, I'll talk. I'm like, okay, let's go. Here we go. I mean, we've seen that the Sunday night football team or the Monday night football team. Historically, there's just been this whole like seed to the role and this is your strength. But as long as everybody likes each other, as long as everybody has a good time, you can make something happen. You just need to make sure that everyone is talking to each other and that they're not talking too much. And I think that this broadcast team, that there has not been over talking. Oh, well, let's continue with the top of the first, 1999 All-Star Game. Market, you know that. Larry Walker bats second and right. Sammy Sosa hits third and center. Mark McGuire cleans up at first base with Matt Williams at third. The DH, Jeff Bangwell, Mike Piazza catching. Jeremy Burnett's first All-Star Game for the left fielder. He of the Milwaukee Brewers and Jay Bell will bat ninth at second base. And we take a look at the defense for the American League. Kenny Lofton in left field. Ken Grippy Jr., the center fielder. Manny Ramirez in right. Cal Ripken Jr. at third. Nomar Garciaparra at shortstop, the local favorite. Roberto Alomar at second. Jim Tomey and Yvonne Rodriguez behind the plate. Pretty good ball club. Not too bad. No. Larry Walker takes a strike from Pedro Martinez. One out, nobody on the first inning, and that's strike two on Larry Walker. Larry Walker, the MVP in the National League in 1997, last year's batting champion in the National League. 32-year-old outfielder, he stands in hitting 382, best average in the major leagues at this point. One ball, two strikes. Joe Torre, manager of the Yankees, in charge of selecting the reserves, the pitchers for this. Goodbye, Larry Walker. See you later. Pretty good start for Pedro Martinez. This is what he dreamt about last night when he went to bed. First, the fastball on the outside corner to Barry Larkin, and now a fastball, a 97 mile an hour fastball that slices the outside corner to Larry Walker. Okay, when uh, there's another thing about broadcasting that I do, Jesse, and I want to get your opinion because it's something Fox just did. They just gave the starting lineups and they tried to give the defense. As I'm watching this, my heart rate as a broadcaster, I'm thinking about when I'm broadcasting and I'm trying to go like this with my head. I'm trying to read this, trying to make sure I'm not going to miss a pitch, you know, where my head's like a bobblehead. And I think that's another example of what makes all-star games so difficult is the director's trying to jam in a starting lineup and the defensive alignment. Oh, by the way, they're trying to do that in between batters. Yeah, there's no time. Why did they choose to put Ken Griffey Jr., but not Cal Ripken Jr.? It just said Ripken. I didn't get that. There's no time in this. Couldn't you, in watching this, couldn't you imagine that there was a pitch clock? How rapidly yeah. is people working? 
Yeah, that was the other thing. Pedro's working really quickly. No one's complaining about a ball or a strike or anything like that. Like, they're just playing baseball. And, uh, yeah, I always like when it comes to the defensive graphics, I like the high home, just like wide shot of the field. This way you can still see like, okay, something happening. Here's just like their names. If you want to take a look, you can take a look at it. Here's the defense, you know, saying everybody's name on a TV broadcast, to me, totally unnecessary. Yeah, and especially to have it be Tim McCarver doing it because he's going to do it at his unhurried pace. And meanwhile, they're trying to hustle him along because we've got a new batter in there. And I think because Larry Walker steps in, Joe Buck is now feeling rushed. And did you notice he said Larry Walker's full name, what, four times in that plate appearance? Also reminded me of how incredible Larry Walker was. <laughs> MVP, batting champion, hitting 382, over 30 bombs at the midseason break. Oh, my goodness, what a stud he was. Right? Oh, by the way, his at bat is now over. That's that's the All-Star Game experiences. Let me introduce you to this great player. All right, he's now out. Let me introduce you to this next player. I told one of our players once before an All-Star Game, don't swing at the first pitch. And he said, why? And I said, give the announcer lots of time to talk about why you're here. (laughs) Let him give him time to say how great you are. That's exactly right. The guy steps in. You say he's from this team. Here's the pitch. uh, Popped out and he's gone. And you didn't get anything in. And the first All-Star Game that I did, I was trying desperately to jam everything in. And by the most recent one, I was just like, Here's the guy. Here's the team. And if we can get one or two pitches in, I can let you know just a little bit more. I'll try to slide in that great bullet point about him. But you can't miss a pitch. So this is where it comes back to headline news versus feature article when it comes to your play. And Jesse, when we did the no hitter episode, you were telling me about how you wanted to mention one quick thing about different individuals in the ninth inning. And I think a similar viewpoint can be taken on an all-star game. Let me mention one quick thing. Maybe if the at-bat goes full, then I've got time for a few other bullet points. But let me get in like this one quick thing. Now, when it's a May 15th game, um, you know, when it's another 14 to 12 Albuquerque isotopes game, (laughs) which I have a lot, then there's plenty of time to get into somebody's life story, right? Maybe it's the beginning of an inning. It's the sixth inning. We've already had 11 runs in this game. Maybe that's the time that I can tell somebody's life story, where they went to high school, where they went to college, what year they were drafted, any sort of mannerisms that they might have on the mound, anytime they've been traded and DFA'd and cleared waivers and outright and all these different types of verbs that we use. At an all-star game, bullet point, here's the pitch. Uh, I, I still have a clear memory of Fred McGriff coming up to home plate in the All-Star game, and they threw to a video of his mom telling a story. And she's telling all about his baseball cleats. And then they come back to the broadcasters, and it might have been Tim McCarver who said, well, this is baseball. They're actually called spikes. But I just remember things in the All-Star game and the stories that are told about the players, it changes. Leading the league in homers. Oh, by the way, here's who he is. Here's about his family, or he's thrilled to be here. Your color, your personal details, everything for an all-star game, it's totally different than if it's a normal regular season game. Now, here we are, 1999. So remember, the year before was the Sammy Sosa, Mark McGuire, great home run chase that saved baseball, saved baseball. So now here we are, Pedro Martinez in the thick of the steroid era, absolutely dominating baseball, the hometown guy on the mound, we've already had all of these elements. We've already had Pedro facing future Hall of Famer Barry Larkin, facing facing future Hall of Famer Larry Walker. Now, oh, by the way, here comes the two guys who saved baseball last year as we continue with this inning. I remember that scouting report. We said he worked the fastball on both sides of the plate. And that's not as easy as it may appear for a pitcher whose fastball tends to tail back in toward the center of the plate. Tonight's telecast also available in Spanish by utilizing the SAP button on your television. How proud they must be right now in the Dominican Republic. Two of their favorite sons hooking up here in the All-Star game. Sammy Sosa leading the major leagues with 32 home runs. He hit 66 a year ago. Taking on Pedro Martinez, leaning back from strike one. First curveball of the night for Martinez, and was it wicked? It's a good old fashioned knee buckler. <laughs> Jelly legs from Sammy Sosa. Whoa. 
And a one ball, one strike count. 96 mile per hour fastball missing to Sosa. How'd you like to hit 66 home runs and not even lead your league? <laughs> Man behind him in tonight's lineup, Mark McGuire, of course, hit 70. The 2 1. And Pedro Martinez is in position to strike out the side here in the first. Martinez used to pitch for the Montreal Expos. How many National League hitters are thinking right now, boy, I'm glad he's gone. Okay. Overall, as we look at the top of that first inning, uh, my first thought is that, Jesse, no matter what game I'm calling, when I finish the top of the first inning, there's a lot of times that I just sort of, like, exhale. Like, okay. I finish the pregame show. All of these live reads, the timing worked out together. The equipment is connected. After the top of the first, I can like, okay, I can just like settle into this broadcast. There was so much that was happening. And I can imagine everybody on the Fox crew from Buck to McCarver to Brindley to graphics operators to replay operators to producers, everybody just going, okay, now we can settle into this broadcast. After Joe Buck got out the SAP read, I think he relaxed because his question to his broadcast partners about Sammy not leading the league in homers, right? That got everyone chuckling a little bit. And then Buck finishes so strong. He sets up the potential for the strikeout. Sosa strikes out. He says nothing because he doesn't need to. He has set it up. The crowd reaction, the picture has shown it to you. And then he comes back in with a great question to send it to break, right? The National League hitters must be glad that now he's in the American League. I think that to see Joe Buck get more comfortable over the course of that inning was a lot of fun. And that is what the All-Star Game is all about. I would compare it to the Super Bowl or to things of that nature where it starts off so big and then the excitement peters out. And I will compare it to the Super Bowl. How many Super Bowl parties have you been to where the anticipation is huge and everybody's locked in on commercials and squares and everything else? And then by about the third, the fourth quarter, everybody who's not actually into the game is done with it. And they're ready to roll home. Maybe they leave. It just doesn't matter. First quarter was different. The All-Star Game has this problem and annually. It bursts out of the gate. The first inning, and you mentioned how special it is to be the starting pitcher. So there's that competition and who's going to be named the starter and what a great honor. And then once you get into the sixth, the seventh, the eighth innings, now we've got the reserve position players coming in. Now we've got the, the slew of great closers. So nobody's hitting them anyway. And all the star position players who began the game, the starting nine, they're out. The all-star game attention just wanes. And that's why it's really special whenever you get a good finish in the all-star game, just because the the excitement really does fall off as the game goes on. The first inning, the second inning, those are the best innings in the All-Star game. Overall, this is a strong inning from Fox. It's a strong inning from Joe Buck. Uh, I would slightly disagree with your contention about how he ends the inning. I would have preferred him to say, like, strike three or struck out the side. I love the way he took it to break with the replay of the three strikeouts, but the National League hitters. I would still wanted something after Sosa strikes out. Yeah. The other point I was going to make was I like the phrasing of how proud they must be in the Dominican Republic right now. Pedro Martinez versus Sammy Sosa. It's very easy to kind of forget a detail like that. Or maybe it's even easy to just say, here's a battle of countrymen, both from the Dominican Republic. But instead, Joe uses how proud must they be in the Dominican Republic right now. And I think that's just a really classy, smart way to set up this matchup. That's also looking beyond the game and looking beyond American League and National League or beyond Cub against Red Sox. It's it's that larger, what does this game mean and what do these players mean to all those who care about them? Because in the All-Star game, people care 
mightily, what do they represent? I think about the Home Run Derby with the flags that we get to see on display and who you're playing for and who's proud. It's a lot more than your team. It, there's so much pride individually and you get to see the friendships come out between the players over the course of the All-Star couple of days. So if anything, rewatching the top of the first inning from 1999 makes me want to make sure that I am seated and locked in on the television for the top of the first inning of this year's game because I really want to watch it and dissect it the way that you and I just did, Jesse, about all these different elements that are coming together, all of these huge storylines, trying to pick and choose quick little bullet points in order to set the tone because, as you mentioned, the, the interest level is going to wane as the game goes along. This is where I get on my mini soapbox and I say, it is really good for the players to wear their individual team's jerseys to add to that individuality nature of the All-Star game. Because what makes the All-Star game so great is the individuals who are given the stage to excel. All right, well, I wanna end our episode on a really good strong note as well. And so I want us to go back to one more clip from one of my favorite all-time All-Star games so that we can end this episode of Crafting the Call on a major punctuation because we like to finish our call strong and I want to finish this episode strong. First at bat of the night for him. Swinging a drive into the gap in left center field and up against the fence. This could do it. Being way through this win. They got a play to Rodriguez. Safe. Safe. And the six game drought is over for the National League. September, Moises Alou was stretched out on the turf at Bush Stadium, dislocated left ankle, fractured lower leg, his leg grotesquely twisted, and you would have bet his career was in jeopardy. He has come back, he hit 331 with 18 homers in the first half, and to drive home the game-winning run with a double to left center in his lone at back. Off the base of the wall on the fly. Albert Bell's relay to Ripken, and Ripken's throw right on the money to Rodriguez. Couldn't have been much closer. Uh, they might have had him, but Paul Rungi was right there. Here's another angle. Now we get another look at it, but how about the coaching job of Jimmy Leland at third? He never stopped him. And a perfect relay throw by Ripken. They knew they had a play on him. Here's Gwynn. We get a different angle. And he's in there. He is he's in, in there. there. Absolutely. Safe. Great call by Rungi. Absolutely. From that angle, you can see the yep. tag was high on the leg. So even though the ball beat him, Rodriguez can't get it down. He's in right and there. Gwyn is in there. Absolutely. Yep. Yep. Okay. I love the 1994 All-Star game because I remember watching it with my buddies from college. It was about a month before the strike that ended the season. But also to get on our high horses here, Jesse. Think about the stars that were involved at the end of that game. You had Tony Gwynn scoring from first base, future Hall of Famer. You had Cal Ripken at shortstop with a relay throw, future Hall of Famer. You had Pudge Rodriguez at home plate, future Hall of Famer. It was hit by Fred McGriff, future Hall of Famer. You had Albert Bell, huge star in the game. Like everybody who was in the game in the ninth inning was a huge star in baseball. We didn't need to know their backstories. But then for Bob Costas, probably the one person we knew the least amount as baseball fans, was Moises Alou. And after laying out, we hear the fireworks. Costas caps what this means to Alou, how he was sprawled down on the turf, how he thought his career might be over. Now he's back as an all-star, and then we see all the different angles with Joe Morgan and Bob Euchre, who were the analysts for that game. Yeah, I, it's this is the argument against what I just said, that interest wanes over the course of the all-star game, because this is great. As you said, all the stars were involved. The headline initially, immediately afterwards, is what? The National League wins. 
because there was such a feeling of entering each year's All-Star game. Could the National League beat the American League? Ah, not this year. How about next year? Not this year. That The National League was looking for the win. And so that was something that they wanted and that the players were asked about. But it's such a great finish and it's such a great moment in All-Star game history. It also goes to show this is what All-Star games were like before they, re- they became this everybody must play. We have to get everybody into the game. Back then, it was just enough to be invited to the game. And only the stars of stars played in games because we were trying to win. And now as we talk about the interest waning, it's because by the end of the game, it's a bunch of people we haven't heard of. It's not the stars of stars. It's not Paul Skeens. It's not Doc Gooden at 19 years old. It's not the final year of Mariano Rivera. It's a bunch of guys that maybe we know if we really follow baseball, but the general public it's the Super Bowl party. I can't win my squares. I've had enough alcohol. I'm going home, you know? Yeah. What I also associate the All-Star game with, if we're staying in the 90s, do you remember when Camden Yards hosted the All-Star game? When Cito Gaston is the American League manager and Mike Messina, pitcher for the Orioles, starts warming up in the bullpen on his own accord. And now you've got the entire stadium going, bring him in. and hating Cito because there's this great Orioles Blue Jays rivalry that started in 1989 and Cito is not going to bring in Messina. This great controversy because that's what happened. You had players, pitchers, position players who didn't get used during the All-Star game because what if you go into extra innings? And then once everyone needs to get used, that's when you end up with ties and that's when you end up running out of players. Glad you brought that up. I think that was the turning point in All-Star games. There was such a backlash towards Cito Gaston for not using hometown star Mike Mussina. It changed the way. And so Joe Torre and all the future managers wanted to make sure everybody got in. And that led to what you just described. I mean, I got used to the starting pitcher goes two innings, if not three. The second reliever goes two innings. So that's four innings accounted for. And now you've got five to go. And maybe five pitchers go for that you're not bringing just seven pitchers to an all-star game. You're bringing many more than that. And then the manager getting asked, okay, how do you slot your closers for the seventh, the eighth, the ninth? There's just this understanding of the guys who are there. They are not going to take part. All right. Well, I'm glad that we took part together in reviewing these clips, Jesse, because even if the all-star game is not what it used to be, even if it has been diluted by interleague play and all these other things, I still love it. I have a party at my house where I'm on the grill and my friends come over and I'm trying to watch it as much as I can. I still love the Midsummer Classic. I've never called one. I probably never will call one, but I enjoy breaking these things down with someone like you who has called All-Star Games. It is quite honestly one of my favorite baseball games of the year because I love the time capsule moment of it. I love the snapshot of great pitcher against great hitter throughout the innings, throughout the years. I love seeing these guys challenge each other. When Paul Skeens takes the mound, I'm going to be excited to see what happens. But it's not just him. I just really enjoy the one-on-one aspect of baseball and that feeling of that in an all-star game, fun combines with great talent. It's just a joy. The star of stars come out, baby. For Jesse Goldberg Strassler of the Lansing Lugnuts, my name is Josh Sushan from the Albuquerque Isotopes. Thank you for watching Crafting the Call. We'll talk to you again next week.